Hello, everyone. Greetings from Bangkok. This is Kritiya Gawiwong, a guest curator of People, Victory, and Life After the War, a series of exhibitions of Vietnamese modern and contemporary art from the Nguyen Arts Foundation. This foundation was founded by Mrs. Quinn Nguyen, a founder of Renaissance and Embassy International School at Ho Chi Minh City. So the show was open since March 2021 at Nam Long and Van Phuc campus. We have planned to launch a public program after the opening of the exhibition, but it was on hold because of the COVID outbreak in Vietnam. But now we are decided to start the first online lecture series with art historian, Dr. Pamela Nguyen Khori, a distinguished art historian who will give a lecture on contemporary arts histories in Vietnam, a Southern perspective. I am honored to introduce Dr. Pamela Nguyen Khori, who researches and teaches modern and contemporary art history, focusing on Southeast Asia within broader transnational, Asian and global contexts. She received her BA Studio Art from the University of California, Irvine, and her PhD in History of Art and Visual Studies from Cornell University. Prior to joining Fulbright University, Vietnam in January 2021, she was an assistant professor in the History of Art and Archaeology Department at SOAS University of London. Pamela has published in numerous academic journals, exhibition catalogs, and platforms for artistic and cultural commentary. She is the author of The City of In Time, Contemporary Art and Urban Form in Vietnam and Cambodia, published by University of Washington Press in 2021, and co-editor of Voice as Form, a special issues of Oxford Art Journal in 2022. And she is currently involved in various editorial and writing projects on the topics of global modernism, contemporary art in Vietnam, and decolonizing art history. Dr. Corey will provide a broad overview of development in Ho Chi Minh City that was significant in the shaping of infrastructures, discourses, and practices of art that were considered distinctively contemporary in the late 1990s and more prominently in the first decades of the new millennium. And she will also contextualize the art institutions and movement in the southern part of Vietnam within the regional and the global context. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pamela Corey. Okay, um, I want to thank the Nguyen Art Foundation and Ritia Gawimong for inviting me to give this talk today um, <clears throat> as part of the a public educational program for people, victory, and life after the war, um, an exhibition that is currently on view here at the Amasi School. Um, my talk today will provide a broad overview of developments in Ho Chi Minh City that were significant in the shaping of infrastructures, discourses, and practices of art that were considered distinctively contemporary in the late 1990s and more prominently in the first decade of the new millennium. So I just want to frame this up front as a talk that spans roughly 1990 to 2010. So this regional account includes the prominence of abstraction and the community of painters that were often exhibited as the group of 10, the programming of Blue Space Contemporary Arts Center, the initiatives and collaborations undertaken by returnee diasporic and local artists, and the ambitious exhibition project Saigon Open City. These activities contributed to the distinctive profile of Ho Chi Minh City, not only as an artistic center within Vietnam, positioned alongside Hanoi, but also as a regional and global hub in the map of the contemporary art world. My discussion begins by foregrounding the historical context in which the first group of abstract painters began to draw attention to the medium, not only as a revival of 1960s Saigonese modernism and cultural cosmopolitanism, largely centered around the figure of Nguyen Trung, 
but also as a distinctive, as distinctively Southern or Saigonese expression of post Doi Mai artistic innovation. These artists provided a form of lineage from the period prior to unification in 1975 and became an informal community of painters drawn together through national exhibitions of painting. This group of 10, as they came to be known, are identified as distinctly contemporary artists through their recuperation and development of a mode of experimental painterly practice associated with 1954 to 1975 Saigonese modernism, in addition to their examination of artistic subjectivity in the face of social and material changes after Doi Mai. So looking back in history, we can argue that a distinct phase of post-colonial modernism took shape earlier in Saigon than in Hanoi. <clears throat> Within a cultural climate most have characterized as dynamic, cosmopolitan, outward-looking, and full of intellectual debate, with flourishing activity in literature, poetry, music, and the visual arts, despite an increasingly unstable political scene and the growing presence of American troops. Modernism, in its capacity to capture this kind of ethos, is the general term used to describe the overarching climate of the visual arts during the 1955 to 1974 period in the South. Within this community, Nguyen Trung was a prominent figure. Trung won the Silver Prize in the first of an annual juried exhibition series beginning in 1959, the annual spring exhibition, and in the absence of a fine arts association, which wasn't established until 1981, Trung also founded the Hoi Hoa Si Tre, Vietnam, or the Society of Young Vietnamese Artists in 1966, with the objective of simply having an association through which they could organize exhibitions and activities. In the 1960s, alongside surrealism, hyperrealism, and expressionist painting, Abstraction was an emergent form with a small but devout following. It wasn't actually until the 1990s that abstraction began to flourish in the South, and much of this had to do with the role of Trung as an organizer and mentor for a younger generation of artists in the post during my period. Trung came to embrace abstraction gradually after a prolonged stay in Phnom Penh, Cambodia in the 1960s, and then later in Paris, France in the 1990s. The former of these stays was not voluntary. According to his retelling, it was in 1962 or 1963 that Trung quit school in his third year as he wanted to continue his art studies in France. But because of the political situation, he couldn't leave the country without permission from the government. In 1964, Trung crossed the border into Cambodia and spent one week in Phnom Penh before being stopped by authorities who arrested him for not having the necessary legal documents. He spent almost one year in the central prison in Phnom Penh as the administration continually delayed his court dates. His fellow inmates were Cambodian, Vietnamese, Thai, and Malay, and he recalls learning much more about Buddhism during his prison stay because of the monthly visits from the Buddhist monk. It was through this encounter that Trung says that a newfound affinity for Buddhism began to bear a significant influence on his painting practice. He thus became drawn to abstraction, particularly as it connected to ideas drawn from Zen Buddhism, and later, through his time spent in Paris, he began to thoroughly investigate abstraction as a form of psychological and artistic process. Inside the Pagoda, from 1999, reveals the lingering appeal of Buddhism, represented both as a multiplicity of icons, or stupas, on close inspection, and from afar as abstract form, suggesting a view through a grid, perhaps evoking memories of his prison stay. The subsidy period in the late 70s and early 80s marked the end of the Young Artists Association in Saigon and a fracturing of community because most of the members were either in re-education camps or had left the country and settled abroad, never to return. Many of those who finished their sentences in the re-education camps also chose to leave the country. Chung described how some artists who stayed would follow the, revolu uh, follow the revolutionary road, in his words, and adopt socialist realism as subject matter in order to have opportunities to exhibit 
as all exhibitions were organized by official associations administered through state ministries. Yet many of them continued to work privately in non-conformist styles and to exchange materials, resources, and ideas with each other in an informal way. The transition into a market-oriented economy following the 1986 reforms and the new open-door policy in the late 1980s signaled little explosive or reactionary activity on the part of visual artists in Ho Chi Minh City. Still, according to painter Trinh Kung, three notable developments shaped the face of the post-Doi Moi art scene in Ho Chi Minh City. One were the activities uh, of the Fine Arts Association, which hosted the bilingual Vietnamese and French journal Mitwe, founded by Nguyen Trung and Calais Tang in 1989, and the organization of numerous exhibitions featuring artists from Vietnam and other countries, such as Singapore, Thailand, and Japan. Another important factor was the formation of the group of 10 painters, which included Nguyen Trung, Calais Tang, and Dao Minh Chi as the more senior painters, in addition to seven artists representing the first generation of painters to graduate from the renamed Ho Chi Minh City University of Fine Arts. He characterizes this group as being exceptional for propelling a highly internalized and experimental subjectivity through their painting and compares them to Hanoi's Gang of Five. The third major factor was the increase in galleries and art spaces as Vietnam's art market was privatized and began to attract growing, sorry, growing clientele through the expanding tourist industry. The Fine Arts Association was an important mechanism and display space for organizing exhibitions and providing an internal means, uh, sorry, in, initial means for artists to find opportunities to show their work and to socialize, comparable as a gathering ground for painters to the cafes in Hanoi. Many painters said that it was during the early 1990s that they began to work as professional artists through their ability to sell through the gallery system. They witnessed the emergence of press coverage and media, international exhibition circuits through state-sponsored artistic and cultural exchanges, and the proliferation of private commercial galleries, all of which contributed to the sense of a professional art world. However, in an article in Mitwe, Kale Tang criticized the commercial orientation of artistic activity in the city. In 1992, there were 130 group and solo exhibitions in Ho Chi Minh City, featuring more than 200 artists. According to Tang, there exists in our city an irrec irreconcilable paradox, which is extremely dangerous to the development and future artistic foundations of the city, yet one where people are somehow gradually becoming reconciled to. This paradox is disregarding the artistic integrity and value of a gallery or work. Art is, is exhibited for the sole purpose of selling pictures. This is the problem. We do not need a glut of exhibitions, but rather need to guarantee that each exhibition satisfies a few basic requirements, above all spiritual requirements, that the work be a noble feast for the public's consumption. The first exhibition of Vietnamese abstract painting in 1992, organized by the Flying Hack Gallery, is still perceived to be a momentous event in the context of the South. For the first time, artists from all over the country, some 30 painters and almost 100 of their works, were exhibited together under the umbrella of a particular style, one that had been banned by the communist government since 1957. The 1992 exhibition of abstract painting followed what had come to be an annual exhibition of recent works, 10 artists from Ho Chi Minh City, organized by the Ho Chi Minh City Fine Arts Association beginning in 1989, and which was held annually until 1996. The coining of the name Group of Ten was a loose title given to the artists from the recent works series, but some of the group's painters asserted that they were by no means a kind of collective or discursive art group. They just happened to have been chosen by the organizers of the exhibitions, namely the Fine Arts Association, although it is perceived by many that Nguyen Trung had a guiding hand in establishing the selection of artists. Painter Chun Ben Tao mentioned that it was natural for them to come together, although they continued to work individually within their respective artistic careers. 
The recent work series would even switch out artists from year to year so that it was not necessarily a consistent group of 10 from 1990 to 1996. But it was the impression that it was the first official artist group to represent contemporary Saigonese art that gave its formation a sense of importance and the style and quality of the works rather than the official roster of artists that lent it prestige. One can characterize the ongoing work of these artists as being driven by inspiration drawn from external observation, which is then highly interiorized and critically processed through painterly abstraction or expressive figuration. For example, Minchung's White, Gray, Black series reflected impressions derived from morning walks around his neighborhood and aesthetic perceptions of something as mundane as the stream of urine on a concrete wall. Do Wang Dong's dark paintings of distorted human figures, often women, embody the disturbances of contemporary society, reflecting the artist's state of mind as he interpreted local news transmitted through the media. And Chun Van Tao and Nguyen Dan Ke both continue to rework their painting techniques to experiment with and to hone their handling of light and color. In a book on 20th and 21st century Vietnamese art, artist and writer Nguyen Huan notes the rise of the individual subject in the Vietnamese art world towards the end of the 1990s, as witnessed by a shift in language denoting the change from the artist as painter, Hoa Si, to the artist as visual artist, Nghệ Si Thi thus demonstrating a paradigm shift in conceptions of modern and contemporary art. The focus on individuals driving the developments of modernism or contemporary art resonates with Trit Kung's argument that the main agent of change in the development of art in a certain place, such as Ho Chi Minh City, does not completely depend on policy like Doi Mai, but also on the authors of creativity. Yet significant developments are contingent upon the kinds of institutions which are in place to support and nurture the activities of artists. And in a place like Vietnam, Conditions of sociality and physical space are highly relevant to any discussion of how exhibitions can be enacted and what effect they have in terms of developing communities and publics for art. Until the mid-1990s, the main venues for large-scale public exhibition in Ho Chi Minh City were spaces administered by the Ministry of Culture, the University of Fine Arts, the Fine Arts Association, and the Museum of Fine Arts. Whereas foreign cultural institutions like the Goethe Institute and L'Espace hosted exhibitions of experimental art in Hanoi, such institutions typically played less of a role in developing contemporary art in Ho Chi Minh City. In the mid-late 1990s, the Fine Arts Association or the University held occasional workshops and exchanges with foreign artists, which according to some local artists, provided Vietnamese art students with a deeper understanding of new mediums like installation. These exchanges were described as valuable opportunities for learning prior to the spread of internet technology in the mid 2000s. While a younger generation in the 1990s was introduced to installation and later performance through such cultural exchanges and workshops, some artists shared with me their opinion that the primary, cha the primary challenges were, first, a lack of support from their teachers, and second, their lack of understanding of how they should be executing the work in harmony with conceptual direction. This resonates with Natalia Krevskaya's critical observation that most early works of installation possessed, quote, strong visual effects, but were still based upon referential functions without a profound symbolic content. Artists often chose to illustrate a topic or a theme as their concept, which transforms their works into an illustrative imitation of a real situation and the fixation of casual or ordinary events." End quote. The development of new institutions and platforms for contemporary art in the late 1990s and early 2000s would play a significant role in providing more opportunities for nurturing thinking and experimentation. Arguably one of, if not the most significant of, these was the Blue Space Contemporary Art Center under the direction of Chun Ti Huyen Nha, the, the wife of the late painter Chun Chun Tin, 
Blue space served an important function in the city's artistic development in that it might be perceived as the first alternative art space, despite its housing in the Ho Chi Minh City Museum of Fine Arts. This alternative status can be drawn from its active programming, which operated independently of official directives, but also did not rely on commercial sales, its role in hosting numerous forms of artistic cultural exchange, and also on Mrs. Mia's egalitarian stance toward providing exhibition opportunities to marginalized artists, especially women and younger artists. In addition, the size and architectural layout of the museum's space pre presented opportunities for ambitious innovation through large-scale installations and performance events that have had no precedent in the city. One particular encounter had motivated Mrs. Nya to begin thinking, or this was prior to the establishment of Blue Space, um, there was one particular encounter that had motivated Mrs. Nya to begin thinking about running a different kind of space, both in cooperation with, yet independently of official, official institutions. Indochina Arts Partnership Director David Thomas had come to Vietnam in 1988 to scout artists for an artistic exchange between American and Vietnamese veterans. This project would culminate in the exhibition and publication as seen by both sides, American and Vietnamese artists look at the war. In Ho Chi Minh City, he contacted the Fine Arts Association to get contacts following the standard procedure and was given a list of artists to meet. This roster consisted primarily of officially approved artists whose work fell loosely under the category of socialist realism. However, in the actual space of the association building, he happened to see some of Zhuang Zhongden's paintings, even though the artist wasn't included in his list of contacts. He then asked for permission to use Din's paintings in the publication as well, a request that, according to Mrs. Nga, couldn't be refused. This made her realize how difficult it was for outsider or unofficial artists to have access to these kinds of opportunities. She then began to use the money from the sales of Thin's paintings to support the establishment of a different kind of art gallery. At that time, the Fine Arts Museum was a relatively new institution, established only in 1987 with a small collection divided into pre-reunification and post-reunification art, a few programs, and little support for artists. When they allowed her to rent a space, she had to agree to certain conditions, one of which was that she had to use the space underneath the museum. The name Blue Space was chosen in reaction to everything that had happened during the process of establishing the gallery as she saw the color blue as symbolic of hope, youth, peace, clarity, and understanding. Blue Space would soon acquire major funding from the Ford Foundation following its collaboration with the Siam Society on a Vietnamese and Thai art exhibition in 1995 thus acquainting the foundation with her work and raising her profile as a contact for future projects. Upon her successful funding application, the gallery changed its name from Blue Space Gallery to Blue Space Contemporary Art Center in 1996. The new source of funding enabled more freedom with budgeting and programming, particularly in terms of providing a platform for new and unfamiliar mediums, such as installation, performance, and video. Blue Space held various group exhibitions of painters from the northern, central, and southern regions of Vietnam, featuring some who are now considered among the country's most prominent artists, such as Ming Nguyen Tang, Nguyen Thi Chau Zhang, Boi Kong Khan, and Li Huang Li. In 2000, Blue Space hosted a performance art workshop held by Seiji Shimoda, thus implicating Ho Chi Minh City in a network of performance art that would sweep Southeast Asia in the 2000s. 1997 saw near monthly exhibitions of installation and site-specific projects undertaken by artists like Le Thien and American artists Bradford Edwards and One Plus One, <clears throat> Min Min Fung's Red, White, and Black, and the installation-focused exhibition, Soul of Soil. Perhaps the most significant, <clears throat> sorry. Perhaps the most significant site-specific installation was carried out by Jun Nguyen Hatsushiba in 1998 in one of his first major exhibitions in Vietnam. 
Seom.com consisted of a variety of installations occupying different spaces in the museum, such as the courtyard and interior rooms. The various components of the exhibition thus dealt in oblique ways with the artist's fascination with cyclos and other forms of public transportation, quickly becoming obsolete in the urban centers of Vietnam, as well as paths of movement, of refugees, of traffic, of Seom drivers. Curious about the open structure of the colonial building, he considered how to make dynamic use of the space. In the courtyard, he set up a mosquito net that spanned its width, covering the entire exterior. The mosquito net was white, with a blue grid-like pattern stitched onto it, symbolizing a kind of maze with no exit. While formally engaging with the site in an unprecedented way, producing a drawing in space, as Nora Taylor has described, the maze-like pattern also alluded to the path and movement of refugees, thus playing on themes that have continued to pervade the artist's work through the present. Blue space became a meeting ground for artists from throughout Asia, both at the level of cultural and diplomatic exchange, as well as more individually driven projects. Such exchanges include a workshop for Thai and Vietnamese artists that took place in Dalat in 1999 whose participants included Chumpon Apisuk, the founder of the performance art festival Asiatopia, Kamol Pausabasdi, and the renowned Montiem Bunma. More small-scale uh, small exchanges include the 1998 exhibition of works by American artist Bradford Edwards and Cambodian painter Spy Gen in his first and only exhibition in Vietnam. An event that created quite a public impact was a collaborative performance between Vietnamese artist Lee Huan Li and Cambodian American performance and spoken word artist Anita Yu Ali, which took place just a few years after performance art had been introduced to the city's art community. In 2005, another group exhibition and performance took place at Blue Space. This also the result of collaboration between local and international artists some of whom would become prominent artist organizers in Ho Chi Minh City, such as Vietnamese French artist Sandrine Bouquet and Vietnamese American artist Richard Streitmatter Tran. The exhibition Rendezvous featured video installations as well as a live performance by the artist Kim Ma. It was around this time that returnee Viet Q artists were beginning to create an impact in the community in terms of initiating collaborative projects and groups with local artists and also raising the profile of the city as another significant contemporary art hub in Vietnam. Much of this energy would culminate with Saigon Open City and the subsequent establishment of a network of smaller art spaces that aim to innovate the nature of exchange, collaborative production, and level of artistic experimentation in the city, as well as develop connections between locally based projects and international platforms in the contemporary art world. The return of several diasporic Vietnamese artists, many of whom had left the country as refugees during their childhood, signaled new developments in the Saigonese art scene, including collaborations that would lead to its pronounced internationalization in the first decade of the new millennium, as well as a number of initiatives to establish alternative art spaces to support a more informal, but nonetheless more active and open infrastructure for contemporary art in the city. It should be recognized that their involvement in establishing smaller independent art spaces in the mid-2000s was partially a response to the fact that they themselves had difficulty integrating into the local infrastructure. For example, Sandrine Luquet studied at the Fine Arts University from 1997 to 1998, but was given a separate space to work and provided with a private tutor, rather than being allowed to study in a classroom setting with other students. Experiences like Sandrine's led many artists to begin thinking about ways to create spaces to meet their own needs, along with shaping a sense of community. A major figure in several of these endeavors was Din Kiu Le, one of the highest profile Vietnamese artists to date. Din had left Vietnam in his childhood and lived in the United States for 15 years, completing undergraduate and graduate degrees in art before deciding to make his home in Ho Chi Minh City in 1996. His work has been deeply connected to topics of Vietnamese history from the perspective of a former refugee, 
and has received international acclaim for his efforts to decenter US centric narratives of the Vietnam War. One of his earliest works in Ho Chi Minh City is remembered by many, both inside and outside of the local community, as one of the most meaningful and provocative works in contemporary Vietnamese art history. It may have been the first public urban intervention to have taken place in the city. The 1989 damaged gene project concerned the controversial subject of the use of the chemical defoliant Agent Orange during the Vietnam War and its lasting effects on the living population, namely in the form of birth defects, and the United States' refusal to acknowledge responsibility. There was also silence in Vietnam due to fear that speech could lead to the actualization of one's fears, in this instance of giving birth to children with congenital deformations, often in the form of conjoined twins. Din had conjoined twin dolls and their clothing manufactured and sold at a busy market stall selling children's clothes and tourist souvenirs. The dolls and their outfits blended in with the aesthetic of other mass-produced toys and thus didn't stand apart from the rest of the merchandise until closer inspection. In addition, adult clothing items were embroidered with the names of companies that had produced dioxin, a key component of Agent Orange. Din and other artists like Sandrine, Tiffany Chung, and Tuan Andrew Nguyen had initially settled in Vietnam as a means of cultural reconnection, which would in turn fuel their creative practice. Richard Streitmatter Tran had studied at the Massachusetts College of Art, and it was in Boston where he met two Vietnamese students, Ngo Tai Nguyen and Nguyen Long, studying abroad. As a result of this encounter, Richard came to Vietnam less than a year later to develop video art curriculum for the Ho Chi Minh Fine Arts University, and was later involved in the formation of an interdisciplinary performance group called Project One. In 2005, he became a founding member of another collective called Mogus Station, whose mission was to promote and present contemporary art in Vietnam. Some of the most, some of the important projects realized by the group include Art, a bilingual contemporary arts magazine published for the Singapore Biennial in 2006, and a collaborative work, Rokovoko, which was featured at the 52nd Venice Biennale. Alongside the high-profile activities of these artists, other major projects were in the works during the early to mid-2000s, most notably plans to launch a biennial in Ho Chi Minh City. Saigon Open City, the eventual name of the project, would mark the peak of global interest in the city as an active contemporary art platform in the mid-2000s, and what many consider to have been height of its activities, collaborations, energies, and possibilities. Unfortunately, numerous factors challenged the potential of Saigon Open City to effect change in the way that the planners had hoped, and it stands out in the collective memory of the art community as a bitterly fracturing event. Several years, went, uh, several years of planning preceded the planned opening of Saigon Open City. Numerous locally based artists went on board as advisors or curators, but would gradually drop out of the planning as miscommunications and tensions rose, particularly in the face of the difficult job of procuring exhibition licenses when artists were still being selected. Not long before the planned launch of events in November 2006, the final organizers of Saigon Open City consisted of gallerist Doti Thuyet Mai as director, artists Din Kule and Chun Lung as advisors, and through Din's contacts, established relational aesthetics pioneer Rick Ritzirvanj and Bangkok-based curator Kritia Gawiwong as the curators. Din had emphasized the need to procure regional practitioners rather than international curators in order to have a combination of seasoned professionalism as well as local knowledge of the limited infrastructures and cultural climates of Southeast Asia. In regard to the name change from Saigon Biennale to Saigon Open City, Gritia emphasized that the theme of Saigon Open City, a title coined by Tiruvannaja, was a, re a reaction against the original plan of doing a biennial, which they deemed as unsuitable for local conditions. The primary objective was to more fully engage the public and achieve long-term effects, sustaining a dialogue with the community and catalyzing artistic discourse. For these reasons, they envisioned the event as consisting of three chapters over a two-year span. 
following a periodized historical scheme, liberation, unification, and reconstruction. Yet, negative reception of the curatorial schema lay with the fact that the chapters seemed neither ironic nor sincere in corresponding to standard state narratives of modern Vietnamese history. In addition, the shuffling of artworks and application deferrals that persisted throughout the licensing process ultimately resulted in Saigon Open City never receiving official permission to open publicly in January 2007 despite some of the major international artists on the exhibition roster, including Yoko Ono, Martha Rosler, and Joseph Boys, and despite the fact that most of the host museums had allowed works to be partially installed. The curators acknowledge that the failure of the event can be attributed to various factors, yet they also attest to its generative function. Ritia Gawe Wong insists that Saigon Open City invoked a stronger awareness of the need to have some kind of discourse and activity that shifted drastically away from what was in place prior, namely scores of small commercial galleries throughout the city. She strongly believes that the event was necessary for the sake of even instilling in public memory the attempt to launch a major international art exhibition in the city that such a conscious remembrance was needed as a starting point, and it could then serve as a historical reference for future endeavors. Many perceive Saigon Open City to have provoked the establishment of small independent artist initiatives, given what seems to have been the contemporaneous or subsequent launch of various programs and spaces which operated on a much smaller scale and that could function successfully by circumventing much of the city's bureaucratic infrastructure. These independent initiatives operated within a more informal art sector shaped largely from social networks, yet with self-conscious objectives to serve as alter alternative sites of artistic formation and critical discourse. Prior to the establishment of many physical alternative art spaces, artists Nguyen Yu Hui, Huang Zeng Gang, and writer Wu Lian Fleng had run what might be considered a virtual artist resource space, VietnamVisualArts.com. A little blah blah, founded by Suhaju and Motoko Uda, was founded in 2005, as was Atelier Wonderful, a short-lived program run by Bertrand Perret and Sandrine Mouquet. Atelier Wonderful served as a physical space in the artist's studio apartment, hosting weekly art talks, workshops, film screenings, and exhibitions envisioned as a six-month venture in the recognition that it could not be sustained long-term. Yet the program is described by many artists as being one of the most successful creative community ventures to have taken place in the city. Din Kulay openly attests to the fact that San Art emerged from the experience of Saigon Open City. He saw a new model of an artist-run space as a way to bridge the gap and create communication with the various Ho Chi Minh City institutions and with cultural authorities, with the larger goal of creating meaningful dialogue and facilitating future projects. Within a year after the end of Saigon Open City, he used personal connections to bring Tiffany Chung, Ton Andrew Nguyen, and Ha Tuk Phu Nam in as co-founders. The space initially held solo and group exhibitions of artworks curated by the co-founders, reflective of their own artistic interests, and featured works by both local and international artists. Much of its internationally prominent profile is due to the work of its former director, Zoe Butt, currently artistic director of the Factory Contemporary Art Center, who was at the time an independent curator who had worked at the Queensland Art Gallery and also served as, as the director of international programs for the Long March project in Beijing, China. But was brought on in a directorial and curatorial capacity in 2009 as the careers of the co-founders had begun to gain momentum and less of their energy could be invested in managing the space. While San Art has taken on a different form in recent years with a new generation of artists and curators overseeing its programming, it continues to take an active role in international dialogues on contemporary art in Asia, particularly in, re in regard to the role of alternative spaces in countries perceived as being cited in the former periphery of the global art world. Since then, of course, 
There have been numerous initiatives and alternative platforms for the arts, too many to list here, often launched by and sustained by artists. And new ones crop up every year, taking advantage of the latest technologies of media, of media communication, provoking questions about how communities can take form and how art-going publics can be developed and addressed in new ways. But I would return to Saigon Open City as a particular moment that served as both an outcome and a catalyst in recent art history in the South, which contributes to an understanding of Ho Chi Minh City as a local, regional, and global art city. It is important to note that Saigon Open City would appear to have been the next step in a chronology of events that has to take into account the role of individual artists in initiating an alternative paradigm of aesthetic practice and hence contributing to the sense of a city's unique artistic identity. For example, the acclaim of Southern abstraction. In addition, an institution like Blue Space demonstrated the potential to attract major international capital to establish a different kind of art space, one that functioned as an exhibition venue and an organizing agency for exchanges and workshops that could operate as an alternative platform to the official spaces of state institutions and commercial galleries. Finally, the assimilation of diasporic returnee artists would further develop interests and forms, such as performance, video art, installation, sound, and new media works, and also initiate dynamic projects in the vein of collective practice and promotion of a transnational art scene centered in the former capital of Southern Vietnam. I argue only after these developments had taken place could such an ambitious scheme, a biennial and one of the most bureaucratically restrictive arts infrastructures in the region, even be imagined. Uh, thank you. So I believe I'm um, going to take some questions now in a Q&A section. And I'm going to be fed these questions um, through Messenger. Okay. Okay, so uh, one question is, how do you think the Southern point of view about the development of contemporary artistic practices is different or similar to that of the Northern art scene? So I think the question is asking, um, how is this, the development of contemporary art in the South different or similar to that of the Northern art scene? Or, um, yeah, I think that's the question. That's what it's asking. Um, so the development of contemporary artistic practices in the South, I mean, from my research and the interviews I carried out, there's an impression that it just sort of took off more slowly and it was much more gradual compared to the North. Um, I did an interview as part of my research with the former chairman of the Fine Arts Association who used this analogy of a, the pendulum of a clock um, that was, you know, how, how do you say this? It was, you know, uh, pulled very far back and I guess that represents sort of the subsidy period. But actually, no, it was pulled very far back in the case of the North, which had experienced a kind of uh, more closed off, in a sense, more restrictive art scene for a much longer period of time. So that when the pendulum was released, it was very active. So, you know, his analogy was that in the North, after Doi Mui, things picked up in a more radical way, that there was more sort of radical experimental um, more radical experimental practices. Whereas in the South, it was like the pendulum wasn't pulled that far back, it was pulled back just a little bit. And so after Doi Mui, it was just a little bit more steady, a little bit more gradual, a little bit more of a progression. <clears throat> Many artists also told me that they think the nature of um, exchange and also migration to Ho Chi Minh City was quite different from that of the North. So you have a lot of artists from Hanoi who moved south. You don't have a lot of artists from the south who moved north. 
um, but that you also had a lot of these diasporic artists who returned to the South because that's where their families were from. So you have a different kind of community that is taking shape and hence there's a different, uh, they're diverse, slightly more, uh, a different kind of, different kind of diversity um, of artistic practices and conversations uh, that took place in the South. Um, so those, those are a couple different ways, I would say, that you could differentiate the development of contemporary art in the South from the North. Um, so, second question is, the southern and northern communities have had a long history of exchange that goes back to as early as the 1950s. How do you think such exchanges have influenced the development of contemporary arts in the south? So I think um, I'll piggyback off of my previous answer was that yes, there, there is a significant history of exchange between the north and south, so that really troubles this idea that there's a distinctively northern scene as a distinctively southern scene even going back to, you know, um, the 1950s. Um, so for example, you know, someone who's acclaimed as like the, the sort of abstract painter of the South from the post-colonial period, that day, was actually from the North and traveled South in 1954. Um, but as I mentioned before, we do have this pattern of movement from North to South in contemporary art and not as much sort of South to North movement on the part of artists. Um, and then I think also we have to look at this as a broader, we can't just think about sort of in-country movement. We really need to think about how international artists, returning diasporic artists have also returned to these cities and the impact they've had, the kind of collaborations that they've had. So there is another question. <clears throat> um, I'd assume there's no government endowment for the arts. On the other hand, were there any restrictions on themes, subject matter, or concepts? And what were some of the challenges early adopters in the arts had to face? Um, this is after, I, I think the question is asking about um, restrictions on artistic practice after Doi Moi. I assume. I think that's a very difficult question to answer, and I think a lot of artists have a more intuitive sense of where the boundaries lie in terms of restrictive subject matter, what kinds of images will raise a red flag, or what kind of material might raise a red flag, in terms of the fine line between nudity and what might be considered pornographic, things that might appear critical of the state, or certain uses of Ho Chi Minh's image. Um, but a lot of times those boundaries are not clear at all, and so artists are often, you know, surprised with decisions taken at the level of the application for, you know, um, exhibition permits, when suddenly certain works are just, you know, not given permission to be shown. Um, so I, I would have a hard time giving some de definitive criteria um, for that. But yes, I think some of the challenges that many of these contemporary artists faced, and probably those who were involved with the organization of Saigon Open City can certainly um, attest to the difficulties of working through bureaucracy, right, in terms of planning something that is very, very ambitious. And uh, there's another question. There is a tendency toward ephemerality amongst the earliest artists with contemporary leaning practices in the late 90s to early 2000s in Hanoi. This results in the lack of conscious documentation effort and the need to form a legacy or a narrative for future access. Do you observe somewhat of a similar trajectory in Saigon when looking for sources or archival materials? What archives have you encountered that you would consider critical to your research? Um, so for my research on this period, really looking at um, 
because, yeah, even the 80s, but really sort of the 1990s and early 2000s, you know, I was very, very, I'm, I feel very fortunate that Mrs. Nya, who ran Blue Space, kept in a very extensive collection of images and archival materials. But um, mo I would say what comprised my primary research method for all of this, even for Saigon Open City, was interviews. So I interviewed and just had a lot of conversations with many different artists um, from the, you know, those who had been associated with the Fine Arts Association, those had, who had been part of the, the group of 10, um, a lot of the figures involved with Saigon Open City. Uh, yeah, so I would say that was my primary research method was what we could call an ethnographic research method. So, yeah, interviews primarily um, because there is a scarcity of, of archival material. We're very lucky that in the north we have the archives of someone like Veronica Radulovic and Natasha Kreskaya, um, and these are collections that have now been uh, hosted with Asia Art Archive in Hanoi and now Blue Space. The Blue Space Archive is also with Asia Art Archive in, in, in Hong Kong. Sorry, I think I said Hanoi, I meant Hong Kong. Um, but yes, I think in the absence of archives, you do as much as you can to talk to people and to gather stories, or you just rely on oral histories. And you have to do your best to construct a narrative that takes into account the nature of oral histories as memories and things that are subjective and flavored by opinions and feelings. Um, but that was, that was a crucial aspect of how I was able to kind of put this history together. And one last question, um, I guess one last question before others. Writing and recording history is not an easy task, especially when it's the history of Vietnamese contemporary art, one that sits at the fringe of the mainstream and the official. Representing history is also difficult, especially in the form of a timed lecture like the one you're giving, as it requires one to choose certain information and have to temporarily leave out others. Do you see this as a limitation to your practice as a historian, or does it allow you to be creative? What is your favorite form of retelling history? If I want to look further into the history of contemporary arts in the South, where do you suggest I should look? So in terms of you know, giving a talk like this within a limited time frame, it is a limitation in the here and now. Um, the talk I, I just gave is actually uh, a dissertation chapter, I think it was uh, 60 pages and I cut it down to 15. <laughs> um, so there's a, a ton of information and a lot of details that I, I did not include. Um, but that's fine because this is only meant to be a snapshot of the larger work. So of course, you know, the core of this work lies in the book or the publication or the writing. Um, that I hope can be accessible to broader publics at some point. Um, so I actually don't think that we have such limitations. I wouldn't see a talk like this as a limitation because I'll give other talks, I'll write different kinds of pieces. Um, so, you know, this is part of a larger body of stories or of history that hopefully can be accessed. Um, so I think it does allow you to be cre creative. And in terms of my favorite form of retelling history, I think it's, it's writing. I think it's, it's writing because you publish something and it's out there forever and it can become a universal resource at some point. You know, it can be, people can debate it and disagree with it, translate it into whatever languages, you know, it can be translated into. Um, and it's, it helps me also in terms of, I'm a practitioner of writing, I see it as a craft. So writing is always part of a process in my own development as a writer and an art historian, but it's also part of a process of constructing history that is a much more collective and communal effort. Um, so I'm just contributing one, one point of view here, one narrative that hopefully others will build on or dispute or, you know, provide a counter narrative to it, which builds up a far richer field of, of history. So if you want to look further into the history of contemporary arts in the South, where can you look? Um, I think now we have 
a lot of different ways of, of telling these stories. Um, you know, art historians produce books and essays. Um, curators write narratives for their own publications, or they, you know, construct these narratives through exhibitions. We have more and more historiographical and archival exhibitions nowadays. Um, for the South, given that, like I mentioned before, we don't have a lot of archival materials, I think talking to a lot of these artists is such a valuable opportunity as most of them are still alive and eager to share their stories. So I think that's, um, talking to the artists themselves is a great place to get started.